Today we are going to look at pressure in liquids. This is Kisembo Academy and thanks for tuning in. Before we deal with calculations retain, relating to pressure in liquids, we are going to first have to first derive how the formula for this pressure in liquids is derived. Now, from the beginning we said that pressure by definition is the force acting normally per unit area. And we also agreed that the, fo the, the formula therefore is pressure is going to be equal to force over area. So now let's go ahead and try and find out how to do. So we are going to use that exact formula to help us derive pressure in liquids. Now right here we are having a can. This can is having water. Now we are having a cross-sectional area A right there, the top, this top surface of the water when you look in there that is cross-sectional area A. Now this water column that is in a measuring cylinder is definitely having weight, is definitely having weight and this weight therefore is exerting a certain pressure at the bottom of this can. So pressure exerted by this water is force over area. Now the force that is being exerted by this water is definitely its weight. And if, if it's, uh, its weight, the force is going to be equal to mass times gravity. So it's the mass times the gravity of the water. Divide that by the area. Now the area, this is the cross-sectional area. So now from mass, we know that mass is going to be equal to density times volume. So our next step is going to be the density. Density times volume. This is coming from the M right here. So it's density times volume, then times the gravity. Divide that by area. Now from this step we know we expand the volume. The volume of this water, this is a cylinder. So because this, it is a circular cylinder, it's going to be this cross-sectional area which is pi r squared divided by h. If, but the cylinder is not always going to be circular. The cylinder can always be, it can be a square cylinder, it can have a different shape. So in general terms, to find the volume of this kind of cylinder, it's going to be the cross-sectional area, which is A, multiply that by the height. So in a way, you're finding the volume of the water. So it means that here it's going to be, the volume is going to be cross-sectional area, which we have called A, times the height, which is H. This is what is substituting for V. Then we still have the density right there and the gravity. And all this is divided by A in that step. So, of course, this uh, at this stage, we can't go any further than this. So, this A cancels with that A. And uh, when that A cancels with that A, you remain with density times the height times the gravity. And this definitely is the how we arrive to that. P is equal to H rho G, which is height times density times gravity. This is the pressure in liquids. Now, height is always supposed to be in meters because the SI unit for pressure is newtons per meter squared. For us to get this newton per meter squared means that our height is supposed to be in meters. Our density is supposed to be in kilograms per meter squared. Then definitely, of course, our gravity is in meters per second squared. Now here, I'm telling us to calculate the pressure at a point 0.5 meters below the surface of a fresh water of density that... This is what they mean, that they want us to find the pressure at a point 5 meters below the surface of water. Now, if this is the point they are talking about, it is 5 meters below the surface. So this is the surface of the water. That's the water. So they want to find the pressure at this point that is 5 meters below the surface. So to find pressure, it's going to be height times density times gravity, just like we had previously derived. So the height is 5 meters times the density. Now they are telling us the density of the water is a thousand. So it's going to be times 1000 times the gravity which is 10. So our answer is going to definitely be 50,000 newtons per meter squared. And that's our answer. Remember I said that the height is supposed to be in meters. If it is not in meters they've given you this figure in centimeters or any other funny digits. Any other final units, convert it first to meters. The R density is supposed to be in kilogram per meter cubed. And our gravity is in meters per second squared. Now, should you 
calculate this this in such a way that the units are not SI unit. It means that the final answer you will be getting will not qualify to be in newtons per meter squared, but it will be in terms of other units. Let's look at the second example. They're telling us that calculate the pressure at a point of five meters below the surface of salt water whose density is that. So the sketch is the same as this one. It's still they want us to find this, but now here we're dealing with salty water. So meaning that pressure here is going to be height times density times gravity. The height is still five meters because it's a general thing. So it's going to be five meters. Multiply that by the density. Now, according to this, the density they've given us is 1029 kilograms per meters cubed. Multiply that by the gravity, which is 10. And definitely when you multiply that, you end up with 51. This is in newtons per meter squared. A paraffin reservoir tank contains paraffin to a depth of 5 meters. What is the pressure at the base of the reservoir? Density of paraffin is 800 kilograms per meter cubed. Same semantics. This is a paraffin reservoir tank. It's containing paraffin to a depth of 5 meters. So it has 5 meters. It's, all this is paraffin. And they've told us that the density of the paraffin is 800 kilograms per meter cubed. So our paraffin, uh, the pressure is going to be the height times the density times the gravity. We know that the height here is 5 meters times the density, which is going to be 800 kilograms per meters cubed according to our question. Multiply that by the gravity, which is 10. And definitely our answer there is going to be 40,000. Pressure in liquids increases with depth. Now, does pressure really increase with depth? Well, that's a question we want to prove in this video. So in this video, we're going to show that pressure in liquids indeed increases with depth. This is Kisembo Academy, and thanks for tuning in. But before we go into that experiment, let's try and verify it mathematically. We have a question right here. It's telling us that uh, this is a liquid column. This could be water. Yes, this is water. This is a liquid column. It is water with points A, B, and C. And we are required to calculate the pressure at the point in this liquid column or in this water column, in this water column at 5 meters, which is from here to there. That is at point C. Then at 10 meters, which is uh, at that point. This is point B. Then at point A, which is 15 meters. So let's try and find the pressure at all these three points a b and c now the pressure at point a is going to be equal to height times density times gravity now the height at point a is 15 meters multiply that by the density now we know the density of water is a thousand kilograms per meters cubed it is a constant so it's a thousand kilograms per meters cubed Multiply that by gravity. Our gravity is also a constant, which is 10. And so our answer here is 150,000 newtons per meter uh, squared. This is also in Pascals. Let's look at pressure at point B. And now we know that point B is 10 meters from the surface of the water. Now what pressure is being exerted at that point? Pressure at point B is still high times density times gravity. We know that the height is 10 meters. Multiply that by density. Density of water is 1,000 times gravity, which is 10. And we shall end up with 100,000 newtons per meter squared. And then also pressure at point C is going to be... Now we know that point C is 5 meters from the top. So it's going to be uh, 5 height times density, which is... A thousand times gravity, which is 10, and we shall end up with 50,000 newtons per meter squared. Now, if you look at all these three answers, you realize that when the height was very high, 15 meters, the pressure we got was very high. And as we went on reducing the height to 10 to 5, you realize that the pressures also kept reducing. So, mathematically, you find that according to our calculations, indeed, it is true that pressure in liquids will increase with depth. It means that the higher the length, or the, I mean the higher the height, or the deeper the water, the higher the pressure. Now, let us verify this experimentally. 
Now, according to our experiment, if you are to represent that experiment diagrammatically, we got a water can, we put water there, and we pinched three holes. This is hole A, hole B, hole C. And according to the results of our experiment, we realized that the hole that was at the very bottom uh, pushed water out th uh, through a longer distance, then the one in B pushed water to that distance, then the one at C pushed water at that distance. Now, this pressure that is coming out of here was able to push it very far through a very long distance because at this point the, 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 the depth of this water or the height is, 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 is higher or is more than at point C. At point C, the pressure coming out is low so the, this liquid coming out cannot go very far. It can only come at that point. So now this experiment simply verifies or it simply proves that it is indeed true that pressure in liquids increases with depth. Now this explains why at when they are constructing the dam, when they are constructing power dam, the base is thicker. The base of these dams is thicker but as you go up the construction, uh, the dams are narrower. This is because they create a provision for the, the, the bases of these dams are supposed to be are constructed to be thick because they are supposed to be constructed in such a way that they withstand the pressure of the water because it increases with depth. Uh, we are required to find the pressure at point B. Now to get the pressure at point B in this vessel you realize in this vessel we are having two liquids. We are having water and we are having mercury. Of course water will float on top of mercury because water is less dense than mercury. Now to find the pressure exerted at this point B we are going to find the pressure exerted by the mercury then we shall find the pressure exerted by the water then we shall add the two pressures and we'll be able to get the summation or the total sum of the pressure that is being exerted at point B in this vessel. The density for water is a thousand kilograms per meter cubed and the density for mercury is uh, 13,600 kilograms per meter cubed. So we begin with our working. It is going to follow that. To find the pressure exerted by water, uh, pressure exerted by water is going to be the height times the density times the gravity. Now the height of the water is only two centimeters. But remember, as far as pressure calculations are concerned, this is supposed to be in meters. Because the SI unit for pressure is newtons per meter squared, so this should be converted to meters. So two centimeters to convert it to meters is going to be two centimeters divided by a hundred because there are a hundred centimeters in one meter. So two centimeters divided by a hundred we shall end up with 0 0.02 meters. Likewise, down here, converting these three centimeters to meters is going to be 0 0.03 meters. So to get the pressure exerted by water it's going to be the height which is going to be 0 0.02 meters. Multiply that by the density of the water which is a thousand kilograms per meters cubed. Multiply that by gravity which is 10. And our answer at that point is going to be newtons per meter squared. The pressure exerted by mercury is going to be equal to again height times density times gravity. Now the height of um, this mercury mercury column is just only 0 0.03 meters, so it's going to be 0 0.03 meters. Multiply that by the density of mercury, which is 13600. Multiply that by gravity, which is a constant of 10. And definitely our answer here is going to be 4080 newtons per meter squared. Now we have the pressure that has been exerted by the water, which is 200 newtons per meter. We have the pressure exerted by the mercury, which is 4080. So to find the total pressure that is exerted at point B is going to be the pressure exerted by water plus pressure exerted by mercury. So the total pressure here is simply going to be 200 plus 4080. And our answer will be 4280. And that's the total pressure exerted at B. 
So we find the pressure at point A and at point B. So what's the pressure at point A? Remember we said, we, so uh, if you look at this, we have two liquids. We have water, we have mercury. So we are supposed to first find the pressure exerted by the water, then we get the pressure exerted by the mercury, and then we just simply add the two pressures. So let's look at point A. Pressure exerted at point A. Now if you are to look into this, let's look at the pressure exerted by the water. Pressure exerted by the water is going to be the height times the density times the gravity. Now the height of the water column is 3 meters, so it's going to be 3 meters. Multiply that by the density of the water, which we know as 1000 kilograms per meter cubed. Multiply that by the gravity, which is 10. And definitely that is going to give us 30,000 newtons per meters squared. That is exerted by water. So let's look at the pressure exerted by the mercury. Now the pressure exerted by the mercury at point A, definitely the, 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 the weight of the mercury be, uh, above that point is 2 meters from here up to there at point A. So it means it's going to be height times density times gravity, which is uh, 2 meters. Multiply that by the density of this mercury, which is 13600. Multiply that by the gravity, which is 10. And from here, our answer will be, this is in newtons per meter squared. So it means that the pressure exerted, the total pressure exerted at point A is going to be the summation of this 30,000 plus that. And definitely, of course, pressure exerted at point A, the total pressure exerted at point A is going to be 272,000 plus the 30,000. And the, our total pressure there, when we add this plus that, we end up with 302,000 newtons per meter squared. The pressure exerted at point B is going to be a summation of the pressure exerted by this mercury column plus the water column at that point. So, of course, again, uh, the pressure at point A is going to be the same. We already got that as 30,000 up here. Because the pressure exerted by the water column here will be the same. But then the one exerted at point B by the mercury column is going to be different. Because point B is right here. And so the column of mercury above point B is longer. It is 3 plus 2, which is 5. So from here we shall simply say that the pressure exerted at point B is going to be equal to the height, which is 3 plus 2, which is 5 meters. Multiply that by the density of the mercury, which is 13600. Multiply that by gravity, which is 10. So this is going to become, so this is going to be give us 680,000 newtons per meter squared. The pressure at B. So, so uh, pressure at, total pressure at B, this is supposed to be pressure exerted by the mercury column. So total pressure at B, is going to be equal to the pressure exerted by the water column, which is 30,000 newtons per meter squared. You add it to the total pressure exerted by the mercury column, which we have just calculated as 680,000. And of course, when we add those two, we end up with the total pressure being 710 thousand newtons per meter squared. In this video we are going to show, we are going to demonstrate that pressure at a point in a liquid is the same in all directions. This is just a property of pressure in liquids. Now to demonstrate this we have a flask right here. This flask has got holes around it. We have a piston here, so when we put, and here is our liquid, this liquid could be water, it could be oil. So what we do, we push this piston inside. When we push the piston, pressure is going to be impinged onto the walls of this flask. And so as a result of pushing, pushing this piston into inside, the pressure exerted into this liquid is going to force the liquid at these holes to flush out. So, in other words, when the piston is pushed, it puts the pressure on the liquid 
and that will cause the water to shoot out in all it will cause the water to shoot out of these holes in all directions now the water shoots out through these holes in all directions with the same pressure and that shows that pressure in liquids acts equally in all directions to show that pressure is independent of the cross-sectional area or the shape of the container in which it is poured we have a flask right here but it is constructed in such a way that it is having protrusions that are having different cross-sectional areas if you look at this shape it's not the same as that shape and that and that and that now this flask was initially empty but then when we pour water into this flask the water levels are going to rise in such a way that they will be the same in this round shaped uh, protrusion in this protrusion uh, that is like a cylinder in this cylindrical protrusion and also in this slanting cylinder protrusion the water levels will be the same it means that the more you pour water for example from here these water levels will rise but they will rise at the same level throughout the entire flask liquid upon pouring is found to be on the same level showing the pressure and this shows that pressure at at the same ground level is the same and it is independent of the cross-sectional area Pascal's principle of transmission of pressure in liquids now Pascal's principle of pressure simply states that pressure in an enclosed fluid is equally transmitted throughout the fluid we are having an, an enclosed container right here we have a small piston and we have a large piston now this large piston is having a load loaded on it on top now if you want to try to make this thing to move up we simply push this small piston downwards now when we push this small piston downwards it means we are exerting a certain pressure onto this now this pressure is going to travel throughout this liquid and it is going to cause this piston to move upwards so now when this piston is able to move upwards as a result of the force we have put here it means we have transferred this pressure has been transferred throughout this liquid equally so it means that the pressure that has been put here is the same as the pressure that is raising this thing up and this is only this same pressure being being able to be uh, transmitted through this liquid is only possible when the liquid is enclosed that is why we say that Pascal's principle of transmission of pressure in liquids is that pressure in an enclosed fluid so it means the fluid has to be enclosed and by fluid it can be a liquid or a gas as long as it's a fluid so pressure in an enclosed fluid is equally transmitted throughout the fluid so when we when we put force on this piston pressure is going to be equally transmitted to this side and it will cause this piston to rise up this principle of this Pascal's principle is used in the hydraulic press it is also used in the hydraulic brake system in most cases we use oil as our fluid and the advantages of this is with this oil is that it is incompressible it can also be used as a lubricant it does not cause the walls of this the walls of this to rust so this illustration that we are having right in front of us is a hydraulic press like i had earlier said that with this hydraulic press force is exerted on the small piston and pressure is exerted and as a result this pressure is equally transmitted to the other big piston and the advantages of this kind of arrangement is that a small force can be used to overcome a very large force just like the way you see when you're driving a car when you press the brake pedal you're exerting a small force to stop a very big car that could be in tons that could be as heavy as a one ton or two, several kilograms so a small force is used to overcome a very large force that's one of the advantages of this kind of arrangement and two uh, forces can be transmitted from one piston to another when we are doing calculations that are regarding hydraulic press we shall use the pascal's principle of pressure as our basis for the interpretation of the questions we earlier said that pascal's principle of transmission of pressure in liquids simply states that pressure in an enclosed fluid meaning that the fluid has to be enclosed is equally transmitted throughout the fluid so right here we are having hydraulic press we are having a small piston and 
a large piston force is being induced on the big piston i mean on the small piston and as a result pressure is being uh, transmitted to the large piston now according to pascal's principle this being an enclosed fluid it means that the pressure that is being imposed here it is it is going to be the same pressure that is going to be transmitted throughout the fluid to that so in this question they're asking us to calculate for the weight of the load for us to be able to calculate for the weight of the load we need to know that pressure at this piston is going to be equal to the pressure at that piston so we know so we begin so we know that pressure at piston a at this small piston is going to be equal to the pressure at the big piston now since the pressures are the same then we know that pressure is equal to force over area so the pressure exerted here is force over area is going to be equal to the pressure on this side which is also force over area but they're telling us to calculate for the weight of the load which weight is the same as the force so this force is the same as the weight of this load they're looking for so it meaning that the force here at this side uh the force was given as 20 newtons according to our question so the force this side is going to be 20 divide that by the surface area which is 4 meters squared this is 20 newtons is going to be equal to the force this side which is the load which we are looking for let's call it f over the cross-sectional area the cross-sectional area this side is 16,000 meters squared now when we make f the subject of the formula here of course f is simply going to become 20 over 4 times 16 uh, 1600 meters squared and then definitely our answer there is going to become now please take note that as we say that the pressure this side is going to be equal to the pressure that side the, when we say force over area here which is the pressure this side is equal to the pressure that side the force should be newtons and the area is supposed to be meters squared if they are in other units we try and convert them back to the SI units we have another question here. A certain second-hand cloth bag is to be compressed with a force of 500 newtons. If the min maximum force that can be applied on the piston with an area of 4 meters squared is 80 newtons, then what should be the area of the other piston where the bag of cloth is to rest? So here is the interpretation of this question. This is the bag that is supposed to be compressed. It is being supposed to be compressed with a force of 500 newtons. And they are telling us that if... The smallest force that can be applied on a piston of area 4 meters squared is 80 newtons. Then what is the area of this piston? The area of this piston that where the bag of cloth is going to be compressed. So what we do here is still like before. The pressure this side is going to be equal to the pressure that side from Pascal's principle, which states that pressure in a compressed fluid, in an enclosed fluid, is equally distributed throughout the fluid. So pressure, if, let, if you were to call this side A and this is side B, you know that pressure on side A is going to be equal to pressure on side B. Pressure on side A is definitely going to give us its force over area is going to be equal to this side, its force over area. And you know that the force here is 80 newtons. Divide that by the area, which is 4 meters squared, is going to be equal to the force this side, which is 500 newtons. Divide that by the surface area, which we are looking for. We do not know it. So we shall maintain the A. And when we make A the subject of the formula, our value of A is simply going to become 500 times 4 over 80. And definitely our answer will become 25 meters squared. Another number. In this question, they are requiring us to find the force on piston B. The question goes that a force of 50 newtons is exerted on piston A. So we have piston A right here, and a force of 50 newtons is exerted on this piston A. Of course, it's exerted into some fluid like that. A force of 50 newtons is exerted on piston A of area 30 meters squared, so the area there is 30 meters squared. If piston B has an area of 100 meters squared, find the force on piston B. So we are required to find the force on piston B if it's having an area of 1000 meters squared. 
We are still going to use the same principle that the pressure on this piston is going to be equal to the pressure on that piston. The pressure on this piston, therefore, is force over area is equal to the pressure of this piston this side, which is FB over A. The force this side is 50, so it's going to be 50 over the area A, which is 30 meters squared, is going to be equal to FB. Divide that by area, which is 1,000. When we make FB the subject of the formula, our answer is going to become 